can we start now yeah i am uh, yeah yeah uh, first uh, i will uh, deliver this uh, welcome address okay hello uh, and good evening to all so i welcome you all for the online guest lecture series organized by the department of electronics and communication engineering the objective of the series is to provide a platform to the students to learn the emerging technologies and skills in electronics and communication engineering field so i welcome our distinguished chairman of st joseph's group of institutions dr b bob monogaran to this event in absentia i welcome mr ss jc priya managing director st joseph's group of uh, institutions and mr b sashi shegar director st joseph's group of institutions in absentia i welcome our principal dr vadi sheshagri rao and dean research dr b parvathavarthini to this event in absentia i welcome the heads of the department colleagues students for this online guest lecture series that today's talk will focus on another booming technology cloud computing so here the computing services are provided over the internet so you have to only pay for the services you use so as a result this technology reduces the cost and run the infrastructure more efficiently the global computing market size is expected to grow from 371.4 us dollars billion billion us dollars in 2020 to the 832 usd that is billion dollars by 2025 so as cloud computing is an emerging technology it is appropriate to organize a talk on industry trends in cloud computing application so in order to get more insight into cloud computing i welcome mr josh uthmani senior manager cap gemini americas usa we are very proud to say he is our al alumni of 2006 batch he has vast experience in implementing the cloud computing projects when i approached him for this event he has readily accepted our invitation to deliver this lecture in his busy schedule i welcome uh, joshua now i request mrs yes Dev Priya, the assistant professor, to read the citation of our chief guest. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. It's my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Josh Muthumani, senior manager at Cap Gemini Americas. He is our college alumni from 2006 batch. He joined TCS in 2006 as assistant system engineer and moved up to being an IT analyst. He joined Cap Gemini in 2013 as a staff consultant and is currently a senior manager overseeing a team of over 100 team members at team events thank you again now i request our esteemed speaker to deliver his presentation thank you so much sir thank you so much ma'am all right i'll let me go ahead and share okay there you go i hope everybody can see my screen right now yeah okay just the presentation right okay yeah, okay. Sir? Oh, yeah okay all right i think everybody already spoke a lot about me so <laughs> i think i'll just wanted to cover quickly so yeah so i just wanted to you know this is my vanity slide right i get to blow my own horn so yeah like ma'am said yeah i am a currently uh, working as a program manager uh, that is my role my title is senior manager so I'm seeing a 100 member team uh, at T-Mobile so basically my team oversees the deployment and release of all retail applications at T-Mobile. T-Mobile is the number 2 wireless provider and uh, pretty much any application that they use in the stores it goes through my team. Right? So and uh, I've been here for 8 years in my current account and uh, i <laughs> this is my vanity slides so i'll just put in all that right and i also drive the financial ops uh, operations for uh, the account which is about 65 million dollars in a year what uh, this means is i run a lot of the pnl so i'm also the numbers guy 
I uh, worked on a large telecom billing migration program so uh, at T-Mobile I worked on the recent T-Mobile and Sprint merger where the number 3 and number 4 providers merged together that was a two year effort and also on a large data warehouse migration for uh, T-Mobile right uh, next I just wanted to you know this is my family so that's me the big huge guy <laughs> Those Hello. are my kids. My son yeah. is Jason. My wife is Elaine. Uh, my daughter is Elena, and my wife, that's my wife, Nirupa. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, now okay. I spoke about me. I just wanted to quickly go over okay. who do I work for. I work for a company called Capgemini. So have... yeah, these are our okay, standard yeah. vanity slides. Okay. We are a 16 billion euro company Check. globally. Yeah, we have multiple global service lines covering cloud and infra services insights and data, which is a data analytics platform, our BPO services, our engineering and management consulting, right? We are huge in India as well. We have over, I think around 1.2 lakh employees in India, right? So, and as you can see the, the division I'm in, which is telecom media and technology, we are a pretty significant part where we're covering 12% of, uh, you know, the revenue that my company makes. And, I'll just quickly go over these. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these. I'll get into the meat of the discussion, right? So this is just what we do. So, Hello? yep. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. No meeting. All right. So, yeah, we have over 30,000 people just working in telecom and, uh, you know, worldwide and uh, 12,000 people working in telecom projects in uh, India alone. Right, and these are all the companies we work with, right? We work with T-Mobile, Verizon, Vodafone, pretty much all the big names that you can see. And also from the engineering, network engineering also, we work with Ericsson, we work with Nokia, uh, Juniper Networks and Cisco. Cisco is one of our major, major accounts and Ericsson also is a huge, uh, almost $150 million account for us, right? So I said who I am, where I work for now, what do I do in a day, right? Most of my day is spent with this headset on my head, right? I spend most of my day <laughs> dealing with escalations because I have a big team. Uh, there will be people issues. There will be project issues. So most of my time is spent on meetings. And uh, the next part is I have a lot of leads. I have to take care of their performance reviews and all that. I have to make sure. So right, currently my revenue for the work I oversee is around 6 million. My target will always be next year, it should be 6.5 or 7. So I have to look for opportunities with the client to increase that revenue, right? And then, of course, there's the whole part of managing the client, which is probably the biggest challenge I have because of you have different clients, different cultural backgrounds. Each person behaves you know, differently, and you need to know how to handle that. Right. And then I'm also the and are responsible for all the social events that we have in the account. So things like, uh, you know, family parties or get, you know, team events and stuff like that. And uh, right now in the U.S., because of the vaccination, we have been able to start some of these events in person. So I'm hoping uh, the situation in India improves and then you know, uh, we can start having those in India as well. Now. Why am I the one? Why am I qualified to speak today? Right? I have extensive industry experience. I've been in telecom. I've been in this cloud practice for quite some time, uh, and I have done multiple cloud migration projects. Most of my projects, uh, most of my applications that I, we work on, are hosted in the cloud. I have a special interest in data warehousing and business analytics applications. So, I I am. Uh, you know, uh, by heart, uh, you know, by passion, a very BI focused guy, business intelligence focused guy. So, uh, and of course I am an AWS certified cloud practitioner and I'm working on my Azure certification as well. All right, now let's get into the meat. This is all the prelude, right? So this is the intro, right? So where, how did we get to this stage, right? So tech industry evolution, right? If you take every industry over a period of time, every industry evolves right so you take any industry right you take even the hotel industry what it was 20 years ago it is not today right 20 years ago nobody thought about delivery none of the hotels would, would have thought about you know oh i need to you know have a separate counter for uh, you know zomato or swiggy or any of the delivery services right now they have separate apps and all that 
you take uh, travel industry I and mean, i still remember only way we could go get around in chennai was in autos now you have uber you have ola you have so many other things everything changes the tech industry uh, is unique in the sense it evolved in multiple ways one there's always that language evolution right it started with your fortran your basic which were pretty low level languages to it came up to some high level languages like a c++ java and uh, you know c sharp and now we are getting to a stage where with languages like swift and python and go where what used to take like 30 lines of code in java takes about 3 lines of code i mean if you take python you don't even have to do a variable definition today right you just say a equal to 10 it automatically assigns that a okay a is an integer so that happened then there was the way the work was done which was previously we used to call something called waterfall where you get the requirement uh, from the business then they uh, a set of analysts will make the requirements into uh, you know uh, they will translate it into something for the technical team the development team will do it okay then they send it to the testing team and then from there it goes into production now it's all agile all of this is happening in two weeks right so the way we work changed next is hardware changed right so now after agile everybody figured out how the best way to work then we said okay where where else can we reduce cost okay i don't want to keep worrying about my hardware right i think sir gave a very good introduction on that so they said cloud computing now that is also pretty much a you know growing stage then came ai ml now we're doing everything on artificial intelligence and machine learning next this year if uh, any of you had seen google io uh, google remote their quantum computers right so that is the next step right so we are very early in quantum computing so probably in the next 2 3 years you'll hear a lot about it so change is a constant so there are also, there is always going to be change the only thing we can do is just align with it go go with the flow right so i'll give a quick overview on what is cloud computing right the simple analogy is hardware outsourcing so we know about software outsourcing pretty much all, uh, all of us know about it all the software that we write the coding we do that is it now the next phase of that was to reduce cost i don't want to maintain my data service somebody else worry about it i'll pay you a fixed fee right so that is where cloud computing came into the picture so if you guys aren't aware about the story of how you know this outsourced cloud computing came in so it was uh, it was again started by amazon so amazon the retailer they built a huge data center and when they saw that uh, you know they were having some extra capacity they thought about maybe we could give this out to other people they overbuilt it right andy jassy was leading that uh, at that time and he's now the ceo of amazon so he they said okay maybe we could sell it this was i think way back in 2004 i'm not sure my exact dates and then uh, it kicked off what would be a new revolution right and today aws makes uh, probably 25 to 30% of amazon's revenue but almost 70% of their profits this is a highly highly profitable business for them because you just once set it up and then you're just raking in money right i am I'm, i'm oversimplifying it but you get the gist right now why did this become very famous right it reduced overall uh, overhead for companies so let's say i am a company a i want to develop an app right let's say i want to develop a chat app so first i have to have i already have my development costs then i have to work with the financial provider and uh, with the bank to get take care of my pay. let's say it's a paid app then i have to host my app somewhere then there will be all the server side processing so if i am to take care of it i have to buy a server i have to ensure it is running all the time i have to pay for security for it i have to pay for power i have to pay for any upgrades anything so this is all called capital expenses that is what we call capex right which means any time i want to do something i have to invest more money into it right that is why we call it capital expense any growth needs significant investment but this way when you go into cloud computing we call it opex which is operational cost so tomorrow you want additional it's part of your day to day operations okay to, i want to add another server 
okay, Amazon, uh, here's uh, add more servers and send it to me in a monthly bill, right? It's a recurring charge. It's an operational cost. So how does this help you? So imagine the same app example. I don't have to worry about the uh, hardware, nothing. My job, okay, I'll just focus on the app, focus on, uh, you know, uh, publishing it to iOS app store or Android market. I'm sorry, play store, why am I Android market? Uh, you know, the Google play store, that is all I have to worry about. Once I code in all the connections to AWS, that part of it is done, right? So that is like a very high level of how this thing evolved and where it is, right? So my client currently T-Mobile, we, uh, they are in the midst of complete cloud transformation. So they are, pretty much moving all of their things from local data centers. So they have five data centers and they are moving pretty much all of it to cloud except for one where they're gonna have some of the critical, business critical, uh, you know, stuff that they don't want anybody else having access to, all right? Now, who are some of the major cloud providers? I think all of you would have heard of these names, Amazon Web Services, Azure, Alibaba Cloud, Tencent Cloud, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud Platform. By market share, AWS is way ahead of everybody, right? And then Azure is a distant second, and uh, at least in the US, GCP is third, with IBM still trying to uh, you know, catch up. Uh, in the Asia Pacific market, both Alibaba Cloud and Tencent Cloud are neck to neck at this point, right? Now, uh, what do these guys offer? Right? What do we say when you say they are a cloud provider? They offer you hardware, uh, you know, a computer in the sense they can offer you a server where you can run a Unix, Windows. Uh, now even AWS offers Mac OS, uh, Chrome OS. You can run any of these. So you have a virtual computer. So now if you want to run a server, you can run it. They can give you hard disks. They can give you uh, uh, virtual networks. They, I mean, I, I have a slide which shows all the products that they offer, right? So pretty much anything you need right now, I think they offer it. And I, AWS Invent, when I, I think this year's Invent, they announced they have over 2,500 products that they offer, right? So they're pretty, and they're now not just physical hardware, they're even providing combined solutions, right? So they, they even take care of, oh, you just feed the data to us, we will process it. And so there's a lot of as a service. I will cover that a little bit later. Right, so these are cloud providers, right? But there are cloud products which we should not confuse about. So these are some products that run on these clouds, right? So I'm I'm hoping, yeah, Zoom everybody knows thanks to 2020. Snowflake is a data warehouse solution that runs in the cloud. Atlassian uh, is one of the largest companies coming out of Australia. Pretty much any industry you go to, any company you go to they will be using some Atlassian product or the other. Of course, Netflix, you all know. Slack is one of the chat tools that we use here uh, in most of the companies. Salesforce is a customer resource management tool. It is a huge platform where even my company, Capgemini, uses it for managing customer contracts and everything. And ironically, if you guys didn't know, Netflix runs on AWS. Netflix is the largest customer for AWS. And uh, anytime Netflix doesn't work for us, we're like, okay, maybe Amazon is you know messing with it so that we go watch Amazon Prime Video. That's the joke that runs around here, right? So, what were the challenges that made us push towards cloud computing, right? So, like I was saying, you need to pay the rent for the data center, you need to pay for power supply, cooling, and cooling is a huge thing, right? When you run huge servers, cooling is a huge thing. So, if you aren't aware, Microsoft just last year completed a a big um, a test of running an entire data center underwater because the cooling costs were so high they actually tried a data center underwater so that you know they didn't have to pay for cooling costs uh, there are a lot of data centers in the norwegian region because they're traditionally very cold so you don't have to pay for a cooling bill and let's say tomorrow you want to change hardware right you have a pair you know intel uh, i6 i'm sorry i5 six series, right, which is came out in 2016. And you want to move up to the Intel i7-11 series. Today, you'll have to go buy it, go to the data center and get it replaced, huge cost. If you have a cloud computer provider, you shut this down, you spin the new one up, you're done. It takes less than two minutes, right? You can't scale. 
right? In the sense, when we say you can't scale, so tomorrow you want to add two servers and say you don't have place in your data center, you have to go get a new one. You have to lease a new one. So there's this law, lot of effort to that. You have to hire a 24 bar 7 team to monitor the infrastructure, security people. So if uh, Google just did a, you know, a demo, I think you can find it in their YouTube channel. They have six layers of security to get into their data center. And T-Mobile's data center also has around five layers of security, right? Today, I cannot walk into a T-Mobile data center. Even though I have a badge, I have an access pass, I cannot enter into it. That's like, there's like five levels of security you have to clear. And then how do you deal with disasters, right? It's a huge cost. So the reason T-Mobile has five is one is in Washington state and the other is in Colorado and one other three, they don't even tell us, right? Because these are all one place has an earthquake. You have to worry about that. Uh, one place has a flood or something. So there's like many other things. So what does this have? How does this solve? On-demand delivery, right? Compute power, database storage, applications, whatever you need. One click, or I mean, I say one click, I'm just oversimplifying it, but it is infinitely quicker, right? The second part is you pay as you go. Today, you bought a server if it only runs in the night for a nightly batch job, right? You're only running a batch in the night, right? Um, you're still running the server throughout the day. Otherwise, you'll have to come in the night, turn it on. In the cloud, you just pay whenever you use it, and then you don't have to pay, right? The second part is you Today, you are at a 30% capacity. You want to go scale up, you can do it. Right? You can access as many resources as you want almost instantly. right? And uh, everything can be centralized in one location. Right? I promised you I'll show you what a console looks like. right? I hope some of you have seen this. So this is an AWS management console. So this is where, from where you kick off. Uh, you know, Let's say you want to run a new server. You go to EC2. You want to run a new serverless architecture, you go to Lambda. Uh, if you want to do uh, S3, this is their data storage. Glacier is their deep storage. Uh, DynamoDB is their own uh, uh, NoSQL database. right? So they also have started a new blockchain. So this is just the first page in a long scrolling list. right? So these are all the services. So just imagine if you wanted to develop any of these, just how much of an effort it would be. Right. The next is uh, Azure, right? Azure is a similar portal. It looks just a little prettier. <laughs> but again, huge list of services. But today, AWS has more services than any of the others, right? I mean, they have a lead of almost 30% more services. Azure is second, I think, with around 1,400 or 1,500 services. Google offers somewhere around 800 services, right? And there is probably, even in AWS, there's probably no one who knows what all of these do. There's just so much, right? So, I spoke about cloud computing. So now what are the key innovations and trends that are happening in this, right? What is the future of this, right? So I'm gonna cover uh, these seven topics. I'm not saying these are these seven. I'm just gonna, you know, cover these, right? So one is serverless computing, edge computing, multi-joint cloud computing, gaming, VRAN, which is a very interesting one, IoT, and as a service model, All right? So any questions before I continue? Yeah, I, I run a I, I go pretty fast, so. Uh, any, any questions? Jagata, you have any question? And actually, another uh, John Knox uh, posted that uh, Oracle is also providing these cloud computing services. Yes, yes, Oracle also is providing, but they're a very small player right now that they only do for some of their core products. So while technically they can, anybody can go and use them, they are not as robust as AWS, Azure, or uh, you know GCP, Google Cloud Platform. So they are. They're only starting with their products like, um, you know, you can run most of their Oracle products like your uh, Oracle DBs and your Siebel's and all that stuff. So they are more into a, you know, niche market of, hey, you want to use an Oracle product, we'll give you a cloud for it. Okay. Right. Any, any other questions uh, from the participants? So when you have any questions, you just uh, post in the uh, chat box. 
it let me okay. move the chat also to another window so give me one second yeah all right okay give me one second there you go all right so let's go into um oh which window are you guys seeing oh you're seeing the okay the right window okay <laughs> all right what is serverless computing right this is one of the biggest innovations that happened in cloud computing right so what this means is like i said you can go and say i want this i want this server i want that server uh, i want this much hard drive i want this much processing capacity blah 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 what this says is you don't have to worry about any of that right you don't uh, you don't have to provision any server any space nothing right let me give you an example right let's say and this is what is happening in coca cola right so coca cola has these vending machines in the us this is very popular which is vending machines right you go you'll find it in every mall offices also will have so you swipe a card and the machine will dispense the drink right so they don't run a payment server at all right any time you swipe it it go it triggers as a request to their server their server then makes an aws lambda function they run it on aws and then aws spins up the necessary resources runs the transaction sends back the response and shuts down everything so what happens in aws lambda is you write some it is called infrastructure as code that's the actual term for it right so you actually write some python code or any language they support multiple languages which tell aws what you want to do right so let's say there is a job right let's say um you know we have a job that says okay at the end of the day we take all the payment uh, this thing uh, accounts we created from one system and uh, it will process it it will compress it zip it and then send it to another system i do need a server for that i need a unix server to run all of this but i don't need to run that server so i i will write an aws lambda function which will say hey get the file from this location all you have to do is put the file in that location or it can even go to a server and pick it up once you get that you run the you run this uh, process i need it to do, uh, be run and then send this file to somebody else this is the code i will write when the aws and you run this at 12:30 every night you haven't provisioned any server nothing so aws will say it will pick it up it will see oh i need these many okay i need a server with this capacity it calculates it i need a uh, data base i'm um, sorry a hard disk with this space it will calculate it it will run it zip it send the file shut down all the servers now what is the advantage if this entire process takes only 3 minutes you have paid only for those 3 minutes of that server and that uh, hard disk you haven't paid for any other time this is a huge saving right so instead of running the server every day throughout the day which is what would have happened if you had to maintain the server you when you run a serverless comp this is called serverless computing because you are not provisioning a server you just tell it what to do and it spins up uh, the necessary resources at run time that is why they call it infrastructure as code right so there could also and this, this is another thing that we use right so let's say we, uh, we have these uh, tickets uh, ticketing system right so tomorrow uh, let's say there is a uh, someone raises a ticket for an access right and this is also another case we have in my client right so once the ticket is raised let's say somebody wants access to jira jira is one of the applications we use right so you don't have to spare, so the moment the ticket is raised it will not do it it will do it on the night so it will take in the night it will take okay 25 jira instances uh, tickets i have uh, you write the code saying if this is the request if if you put all your conditions and then it will say oh okay i need to take this up generate a flat file and send it to the jira server and it will process it so instead of somebody sitting in every day every time the request comes you spinning up the server to process it it takes less than 30 seconds and what would have been actually 30 minutes net tasks uh, if somebody had to do it manually or if it does it is done in real time because they use this cloud uh, serverless computing it is done in 30 seconds and they pay for only 30 seconds of 
the uh, you know the services to aws so you can imagine that is almost one less than one tenth right of the uh, you know your expenses not even 10 it's like one percent of uh, you know the cost of what it would be for running it 30 minutes so these are the you know this is that is why this has been a big big change for most companies right so serverless computing has in the last i think 3 4 years changed the way companies operate because everybody is going and doing this right the other thing is it's highly scalable and highly available in the sense let's say today you gave 30 tickets tomorrow you gave 30000 tickets if you had provisioned the server you might it may take longer right so when you run it in aws lambda or azure function or google cloud function you don't have to worry about it. You give it 30,000, 30 million, it will spin up how many, how, how much ever capacity is needed to process it. And then once it's done, it will shut it down, right? It, it knows what needs to be done because you have written it in the code and you don't have any idle capacity and it's called micro billing in the sense you're only paying for that exact seconds you're using it, right? So this is a game changer and this has been embraced by pretty much all of them. Everybody now has this. So each one has a different name for it because it is, uh, you know, Azure calls it functions, AWS calls it Lambda and it has the Lambda symbol. Uh, but yeah, uh, this has been one of the biggest changes in the industry, right? Any questions on this? This is, this is very near and dear to my heart uh, other, and this and another topic. All right, the next one is edge computing, right? And by the way, I kept a new template in every slide so that you guys don't, uh, you know, doze off. <laughs> edge computing right edge computing is a again a new concept and a lot of uh, you know people are excited about it so what is edge computing edge computing is you have cloud computer your cloud servers in multiple different locations right i think aws has like 40 locations but there are still entire nation your entire world you have only 40 locations Right. So then, which means I'm losing a lot of time. So the, what they mentioned here was for devices to be smart, they need to process the data they collect and take applicable action. So which means that you have to have the devices without the need to be transported to another server environment. Put it very simply. Let's say there is an you need something to be done instead of sending it to the entire you know cloud server and getting it done there. What if you could get it done in the device that is triggering it, right? This is called distributed computing. So what is a, uh, I'll give you a perfect example, your cell phone, right? So today, if you're using an Android device, most of your Google assistant is done on device. That is an example of edge computing. So the computing that is needed for that function is taken care on device. With iOS 15, Apple is also going to do that. Today, if I use Siri on uh, my iPhone, it take it goes all the way to the server. It takes another four seconds for it to come back because it is not using the edge computing technology, right? So anything and everything that it does, it has to go to a huge server and come back, right? So edge computing is nothing. We're trying to move the computing further, closer to the client, right? To the customer or the client, right? Uh, and this is extremely critical in the rollout of Internet of Things and 5G applications. Why is because all of these things that they're saying about autonomous vehicles and uh, you know medical uh, enhancements, all of these, every if you have to reduce the latency and if you have to get things done quicker, you cannot keep. Let's say you are in, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you an example of the US because geographically I I know it. So let's say you are in the middle of US and your server is in Washington state, there is still a latency for the data to go to Washington state and come back. But what if you had a server that was 50 miles from you, right? So how is this happening is a lot of the companies are, a lot of these uh, cellular companies are offering edge computing on their towers. My, not huge, but some small level of edge computing. They're like every 10 towers will have an edge computing server. So you can start using that for any local processing. you need. It is not going to be a replacement for your huge data centers, but it will have some specific applications so that you don't have to hit go and hit your server. So for any time critical applications, you 
that is where edge computing is going to go right so if in the us there are four data centers for aws uh, for edge computing they have around 67 or 70 right so it is not as uh, the same as as heavy as this uh, or as huge as this but your regular data center but it's a smaller data center so this is cdns are also kind of uh, edge networks content data networks right so you, when you watch uh, your netflix or amazon you don't you're not hitting in uh, the server uh, that, that is way i think uh, aws center in india is in bangalore or bombay i don't know so let's say you are in delhi or uh, your nagartala and you're hitting amazon they actually have edge centers in, uh, in i think calcutta and delhi so you'll probably hit something closer where they store they cache the information right if you need something that nobody you know if you are watching something that is frequently accessed they'll put it there let's say you're watching a very old movie that you know not a lot of people watch then it'll go to that server it will cache it and then it will bring it in right so that is where edge computing which helps reduce latency okay so now we spoke about all these things right now another trend that is huge right now is multi joint cloud computing what does this mean so i am a big company right let's say i am walmart right and i need to use a cloud server i don't want to you know stick with one company right i don't want so what we call this is vendor lock in or not putting all your eggs in the same basket so what i'll do is hey aws you go, you host all my servers azure you host all my data uh, google cloud you do take care of all my ai ml right so what 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 happens this way is let's say aws decides oh well not all your money is with me so from next month i'm going to increase your rate by uh, 30% where are you going to go it is going to cost you too uh, you know 10 times more to move all your data all your stuff from here to another provider so you're stuck with me so i'm going to increase your price by 20% what can you do right so that becomes a cap too so that becomes a vendor lock in right the other thing is there might be some places that are better for other things right so if you look at cloud, uh, running ai ml workflows nobody comes close to google clouds uh, tensor processes right their uh, tensor processes are so good uh, on their servers that they run the fastest i mean ai ml they are the uh, world leaders right in uh, uh, google so a lot of people use uh, google for ai ml the same way uh, blob storage nothing comes close to azure so this is why companies have higher cloud architects who say yeah don't put everything here put this there put this there put this here now again there is there are uh, companies which help you manage all this because some of this becomes a bigger headache to manage right oh i what do i have here what do i have there you have to remember that so there are some companies who help you say don't worry about it here is one console which tells you what is which is where right you pay them a small amount of money they'll help you manage all your multiple cloud platforms right so but this also is not simple right uh, why because now your data is flowing through multiple systems you have to take care of the data security you you almost every day today morning also i got an email just before i joined this i got an email right my data was breached my email address got leaked somewhere from some people right so you have to make sure that you are protecting your data in each and every server so if it's in one place you can take care of it it's easier when it's in multiple places it becomes a little more complicated so that is a major challenge right then there are multi cloud products uh, snowflake right snowflake lets you have, you know uh, spin up a data warehouse and on the console itself they let you say hey you can replicate this entire data warehouse for backup uh, let's say you spun it up in aws you can replicate it exactly the same in azure so that it's a backup so let's say aws went down your business won't be impacted your azure will immediately come up and uh, you don't have to do anything about it snowflake will take care of it right so snowflake is a huge company right now they just went public and are worth like 60 billion dollars and everybody wants to get get in on them then there's uh, cisco cloud center suite cloud pack nutanix all these guys are you know they provide you with uh, uh, a platform where you can see how your aws servers are doing how your azure all in one place right so you don't have to have three different windows and you know 
okay, well, how, why is my server is my server up here there everything so they kind of help you integrate everything into one right any questions let me check the chat okay nothing okay oh sorry all right so the next one is one of my favorites that's happening right now right gaming game streaming the gaming market is if i'm not sure if you guys know is bigger than hollywood so hollywood makes about 15 to 16 billion dollars in a year the gaming industry makes around 70 billion dollars right and in this space uh game streaming is the fastest so what is game streaming right you pay a monthly subscription and you don't have to own a console you don't have to buy an xbox one x you don't have to buy a, a playstation 5 you just pay for a subscription and you can play on your iphone on your tv or on your ipad or android phone right this would not have been possible without clouds cloud computing right the reason being they have these huge data centers where they're running so microsoft literally has xbox one x as a server blade and they have a data center filled with server blades filled with this so i use xcloud right my son plays on his ipad so what he does is you open up the app you say this is the game i want to play within 30 seconds the game is on he takes the controller and he he plays on the ipad right when i want the tv and i'm not ready to give him the tv that's how he plays right so just imagine what was the infrastructure that was needed and if you had to run it today there are 25 million subscribers for uh, microsoft's game pass right if they had to if you had to build a data center for something like this it is near impossible right and just so the the possibility of this is only because of this right so again i said ipad you could also do it from a browser right so let's say there's a new game that came out, right? I think, um, let me take any of the new games that came out. Uh, and, and Halo Infinite is coming out, right? So which is coming out this year is, and you, if you go to the retail price, you go to a store and buy it, it is going to be $60, the game. And once you play, finish the game, it's done. You're not going to do anything about it. Uh, you're done, right? And $60 is gone. Let's say you can finish the game in one month or two months also, Max. Let's you pay for Microsoft X Cloud or Microsoft's Game Pass. You finish it in one month. You're paid fifteen dollars for it. You finish the game. You cancel your subscription. You're done. You paid fifteen dollars. You played the game and you're done. You didn't have to pay anything more, right? So, in this has been a revolution in the gaming industry, and it is all possible because of Microsoft's Azure power, right? Sony uh, has been struggling to catch up on this. So uh, right now in the recent E3, Microsoft announced 30 games and of which 27 are coming to Game Pass, which means you pay $15, you can pay all, all of those 27 games. You don't have to pay anything extra. Whereas uh, Sony charges $70. So these things are industry changing and it's all possible because of where the industry is involved. Some of the game streaming providers are Microsoft's X Cloud or they call it Game Pass Cloud. Then there's Google Stadia, GeForce Now, Amazon Luna. So, in all of these, you don't have to download anything. Just go to the browser, start playing, game over, right? It's as simple as that, right? The next one is very interesting, right? This is new and it's called Virtual Radio Access Network. So you have a tower and there's a lot of, the tower is not just a radio antenna, right? A cell phone tower. There is a lot of stuff that happens in it. Right, there is a lot of uh, software that runs on the hardware. Right, there's a networking functions that run. So what VRAN does is it virtualizes that, lets the uh, tower be just the tower, and runs this on the cloud. Right, what happens is network functions virtualization is the term for it. Right, so like I said, infrastructure as code. Right, so what happens is you don't have to buy. So today even at uh, T-Mobile, when they buy 5G towers from Ericsson, it comes with, oh, 
uh, they have to do a multi-billion dollar deal with Ericsson and say, hey, I want this, I want that, it should work this way, it should work that way for me. And then Ericsson will go ahead manufacturing it, doing the firmware coding, and then it comes, right? Big work that Ericsson uh, has to do and T-Mobile has to test it, blah, blah, blah. When you use a VRAN on a cloud, you can just go and say, hey, uh, Huawei or Ericsson, you just give me the tower. I'll take care of all the networking functions. You don't have to worry about it. So T-Mobile will write the code themselves. They will run it on their cloud. All they have to do is connect it to the tower, right? So you have eliminated a huge uh, portion of the, uh, you know, a delay and a cost that is because Ericsson will say, I am going to write the code on the firmware. It is going to take me another six months because I have to do it in each and every tower, blah, blah, blah. This way, what will happen? Hey, you give me this tower, you come and install it and go, I'll take care of all the way networking functions, right? So, and uh, DISH uh, is a network, uh, right? Um, DISH is a, a streaming provider in the US who's just now bought uh, a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth from T-Mobile and bought T-Mobile's prepaid business. They are uh, going to spin up their entire 5G network and they are actually going to do it with AWS. This is going to be the first in the US, the first nationwide VRAN uh, and ORAN, uh, open radio access network based rollout, where you know, all of the networking functions are gonna run in AWS, right? So this is a huge uh, proof of concept that they're trying. And if it works, uh, you know, the sky is the limit, right? Because pretty, and, uh, pretty much everybody is gonna try and go with this if it is, able to solve the problem of you know cost and uh, time that is lost in uh, you know setting up a network right all right uh, the next is again a very fancy term that everybody hears these days right internet of things so internet of things covers a broad range of devices from uh, internet switches, your Google Nests, and your uh, Amazon Alexa, everything, right? So how does cloud computing is? Um, you can, the way it works with the cloud computing is you can host everything there and you can use the internet to do anything, right? You can, I don't have to be here for things to happen. So today, every day in my house, there's a light in the backyard, right? We turn it on in the night and we run it for one hour, but I don't have to do that. I have written a, a small function in the app and it says at sunset, turn it on and then turn it off at, after one hour, right? This is not even stored in the app. It just goes, it's stored in the cloud. At uh, It checks my location. It says sunset is going to start in five minutes. Go ahead and turn on, right? Again. You, your phone doesn't have to be in the network. Your phone, you don't have to be near it, nothing, right? Imagine security systems, remote cameras, right? So sometimes I get an alert in my camera when I'm outside saying somebody was there in the in front of your door. Most of the times when I open it and see, it's usually my neighbor's cat, which is walking in front of my door. So, but I am able to do that because of all this, you know, distributed networks, right? Distributed computing. So. Advantages, again, uh, some of the major advantages are, you know, it allows you for more complex actions without actually having device having actual intelligence for it, right? So today, I have multiple functions that I write. So when I leave home, I don't even have to do uh, say anything. My home kit, I uh, have written a function which says, if Josh leaves home, then turn off all the TVs, uh, you know, raise the temperature on the thermostat, and make sure the security system is armed and move all the cameras from streaming to recording. I don't even have to type any, uh, you know, do any of these manually. You write a function, it gets stored somewhere, and then it is able to, and all of these devices are from different providers, right? One is from Anchor, one is from Nest and everything. So it is able to do this just because of the distributed data and server management, right? And then there is also the pairing with edge computing that a lot of companies are now doing where, uh, you know, uh, right now my cameras, like I told you, the cat detection is not done on the cloud. It's done locally and then it is processed. So all of that is, you know, a part of the whole cloud computing. 
Now, the last one we mentioned was the as a service model, right? What is this as a service model? So there are, I've just given four things, right? As an example, right? Platform as a service. Platform as a service is, hey, you want servers, you want data, you want uh, uh, this thing, you want uh, AI uh, ML processing server, anything you want, we have it, right? There is nobody else you have to go to, just come to us, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, we'll take care of everything for you. That is platform as a service. Whatever you need, we are there. We are the supermarket. The next is software as a service, right? So what is software as a service? Software as a service is nothing but, I don't even want to build the software. I just want to use it. I, uh, I just want to you know, pay a monthly subscription uh, and do what I need to do. I don't even have to worry about setting up a server, creating this code, creating the software. Examples are Salesforce, Office 365, Google Workspace, like the meeting on Google Meet right now, Adobe Creative, uh, Creative Cloud. All these are software as a service. You just pay a monthly subscription, you get whatever you need. Uh, the third type is infrastructure as a service, right? Which is Amazon EC2, which is, hey, I just want to use your servers. I don't want to use anything else. Uh, right, which means you just need Amazon EC2. Linode is another company which says uh, a lot of uh, people that host websites, they just need a server to host their websites. They're not gonna run huge databases or uh, AIML, right? So Linode says, okay, for $7 a month, I'll give you a Unix server that is capable of uh, running a website that can have up to, you know, uh, 10,000 visitors per hour, you know, no problem, you should not have. So any small, uh, you know, new provider, uh, new company, small company that is setting up a web server. They don't have to go to Amazon, set up the whole lock. So there are companies like Squarespace, it'll say, okay, you pay $5 for our website and you pay $7 for the Linode, you're all set. So for, uh, you know, $12 a month, you have a good website and a proper server to host it. So those are all infrastructure as a service, which is you just need some place to run your server. That's all. The next one is another new interesting one is identity as a service. So what happens is a lot of companies are now moving to a Jokta, which is you are virtualizing your identity management. So one, when a new employee joins, they, uh, get, they, say, they get registered on Okta and anytime you need access to an application, right? You don't have to provision access to that application manually, right? So let's say you are a new employee, you joined and you need access to, uh, you know, some other app, a new, the timesheet application. Usually previously how it used to be is, oh, the timesheet applications admin will have to provide it, provision it, blah, blah, blah. Any application will have its own admin. With Okta, what you do is you virtualize all that. So one admin, Okta admin will take care of any provisioning. He will say, okay, there's a, it's literally a checkbox. It will have all the company's applications. So let's say you, they pull up Josh, they will say, hey, uh, you know, Josh has access to application one, two, three. He has a requested application for six, it is approved. I, he applies the checkbox and clicks apply over. So the next time I log into Okta, it'll say, hey, new application has been added to your access and I can go to any application from there. So what is happening is the company doesn't have to worry about provisioning this, that, right? It's all through Okta. So one admin can take care of all applications. Right, and that is where I was saying it is all automated. Also, so you just do a job, you put everything in a file, send it. Octa will process it, and it's done. So this is a new trend, and it's uh, Octa is one of the fastest growing companies in the world because they are helping solve huge, huge problems. All right, so I think I've been speaking for some time. So um, any questions till now? Uh, Joshua, uh, uh, Vignesh, D has asked one question. What is a hybrid cloud? Ah, very good question. Okay. A hybrid cloud is nothing but when you have data split between your own domestic, your own data center and also a cloud provider. So 
a lot of companies have when you start going into cloud computing you start with a hybrid cloud because you're not going to immediately start pushing everything into the cloud so a hybrid cloud is where step by step you're moving into the cloud so that when you have both uh, local and cloud it is called as hybrid cloud so your product or your solution has a mix of local and cloud it is called hybrid cloud okay any any other questions ah jayestree has asked another question the data has been leaked then how can we uh -huh. secure our data while transport <laughs> yes this is a very interesting question right so data leaks happen in two three ways right data leaks happen in transit or at rest so what is at rest is it leaks from the place you have stored it so couple of the leaks that we had was somebody had stored it in an aws server right they didn't encrypt the data in the sense it was a flat file it was a dot txt file it was a notepad file and it was in a public aws location so in aws you can expose your uh, data uh, your data store as public or closed right so they left it open and they left it in a dot txt file in a public location which is multiple levels of no no the so what they usually do is one it is encrypted which means it is you uh, you know every value uh, the f entire file is encrypted then every value is hashed when we say hash is you apply something like an md5 or there are multiple hashing algorithms so what they do is when you say josh muthumani right that's my uh, user id so when i put in jo when they store my username it will not even be stored as josh muthumani it will be stored in a hash value my password will also be stored in a hash value so if somebody gets that hash value also they cannot even decipher it because that is not exactly what that is not even the password that i have because it has been run through a hashing algorithm right so if this is what happens when you enter your password right when you enter your password in a website and you click submit let's say gmail the website the browser itself does a uh, encryption hashes it and sends it to google and then google will only check the hash against your database hash right so that is how they find out that you have used the previous password they are not actually storing your password 1 2 3 and uh, checking oh password 1 2 3 right so when these are again big companies do this smaller companies they don't want to spend the time uh hashing and encryption is a costly process you have to pay for it uh, service uh, the servers for it the other is when it is lost in transit right so transit is when you are moving data between systems you are moving it through the internet actually the same process applies how are you transporting it right you are going to jump it through multiple uh, servers how are you transporting it if you are transporting it open without encrypting it anybody and everybody can catch it right that's why we have these white hat hackers who go into systems and they say hey guys you are just transmitting it openly i was able to get in here i know the ip address I got I connected in here I'm able to see it and you know your data is pretty much available so my data leak this morning I mentioned right it is from a, you know uh, I listen to I watch a lot of uh, YouTube gamers and all these right so they they sell out t-shirts right so one of the companies is called Teespring so where I gave my email address for getting the receipt so these guys stored it in a flat file in a again uh, an open server so somebody found that and all my my email address and my phone number was leaked right these guys are a t-shirt company they are a retail company they don't know anything about data security that is why that now even aws and amazon are offering you know data security as a service right so those are the two ways in which data you know gets leaked the other way a lot of companies use is today I, all of us are working remote right i haven't gone seen my office in like 18 months how we go about doing that is something called a vpn virtual private network so they give me a certificate and uh, based on the certificate i use a vpn software so once i uh, connect to that vpn uh, use that certificate to connect all the data between whatever i use all the internet connection in my computer goes to t mobile server encrypted using the certificate so anything i do any network activity on my device goes through that vpn right so that way unless you have an uh, certificate to the or a key to the vpn 
you have no way of seeing it. and every individual user has a different uh, vpn certificate right so if i and my friend are also connected to the t mobile he cannot see any data in mine because it's encrypted using my key so it uses that public private key encryption so uh, only t mobile servers can decrypt it and then uh, allow the connection so that is how it works right so i see another question is cloud computing uh, and yeah. mobile com yeah, computing the same so mobile computing is more like edge computing what happens on your devices on device uh, recognition on device processing those are more like edge computing cloud computing is when it goes when it's hosted on a separate data server i hope that answers it any other question any other questions i hope i wasn't uh, you know boring or i wasn't droning on too much i, I and i speak no, too no. fast as well <laughs> actually it is very interesting joshua yes yeah, you you, are, you spoke a lot of uh, technologies what the students are reading in the textbook uh, ran cloud computing edge computing so these things uh, a uh, practical exposure you are given to them then uh, john what is the question uh, virtual machine oh okay, okay. What is virtual machine yeah oh that's uh, okay i think virtualization and virtual machine both are pretty related so john and uh, shrimati right a virtual machine is very simple which is uh today we use that for most of our offshore right when suddenly everybody at offshore had to work from home in my india team we couldn't get laptops for everyone and they you know most of my offshore they use desktops how do i so we need to get them computers before lab, laptops also were in a shortage right so what we did is uh, and we don't want people to use their personal laptops because of data security data breach vpn blah 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 right so what we did is in aws we spun up a virtual computer it is nothing but i go into aws and i say hey i want to spin up a new uh, windows computer and these are all the properties i want in it and use this vpn certificate and uh, it spins up a brand new windows desktop and uh, you uh, once you give access to that that person so anybody who was in my offshore team they are, each had their own virtual computer and they used to log into that and it is just like a windows desktop only thing it works out of a browser that's it so you can provision how many ever you want and the moment they log off you are not paying for it so if they're using it for eight hours you're just paying for eight hours right virtualization is similar right it's basically whatever you have physically uh, usually like laptops and uh, desktops and uh, servers you are running it as, on a different on a, on the server right so i think let me see if i can spin one up give me one sec I think I can share. I am locked in. Give me one second. Give me. I'm just logging into my AWS server. I'm doing a captcha challenge, guys. It's not easy. I'm getting old. <laughs> NS two six. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry about the delay, but I just want to show you guys a console, right? About uh, AWS console. All right. Let me share that. Stop presenting. Uh, uh, you're able to see my screen, right? The AWS console. No, we are uh, we are not able to see. 
Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. I haven't clicked share. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. How about now, sir? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, this is the simplest version of an AWS management console, right? So, you asked about a virtual machine. That's the first thing that they put up. So, I can go in to launch a virtual machine. And it gives you all these options on what type of server you want to open. So the basic, the free one is a Amazon Linux 2 uh, AMI, which is an Amazon uh, Linux, Amazon's version of Linux. Then you can run Mac OS Big Sur, Mac OS Catalina. So if you're developing iOS apps, you can use this. Red Hat. So mostly all servers run on Linux and Unix, right? There you go. Windows Server. Debian Linux, oh, there are like so many, right? So Windows Server, Windows Server, mostly. And then there are also, let me search by Windows, right? I can search by Windows. Right? So if you can see, all these types of versions are there. Then there is also the marketplace. You can set up a uh, server and say, this is how I want to uh, run it. So there you go, NVIDIA Gaming PC. Right, you can actually run a gaming PC on this. So the, all I have to do is select. I'm not going to do this because it's going to charge me money. So there you go. This is how they calculate the cost. All of the software is free, and it will charge me if I go with this type of instance. Right, you can see. It will be seven dollars two hundred and seven point two nine six dollars per hour. So imagine if I have to build an NVIDIA PC today with all the shortage, it will cost me around two thousand dollars. So let's say I want to get a game on this and I don't want to invest in it. For $7 an hour, I can actually go ahead and start playing some games. Right? So I go to continue. And there. It is asking what type of server. Yeah, this is the this thing. Right? This is the CPU. So this is all custom CPUs that they've built. Uh, how many threads? How many gigabytes of memory? What all you get with it? Network performance up to five gigabits internet speed you get with IPv6 support. So all of this once you choose, there all these are not eligible, right? It comes down. Yeah. So all you have to do is uh, review and launch, and it'll launch it. I don't want to do that because I don't want to pay money right now for it, <laughs> right? So this is how you spin it up, right? It's it's that that's how simple it is, right? So I can. Even so, they have you can even they even have tools for AWS migrations. So you want to move data from another cloud to here, you can do this. You want to start everything serverless microservice, Lambda API gateway, every each and everything they have. So this is the um, simplest version, right? If you want to see all services, there you go. So Amazon recognition. So this is a data, yeah, deep learning image recognition service. So they have multiple APIs where. You give a device, uh, image and let's say you want to build an app for image recognition app. You can use Amazon recognition. You don't have to build them AI ML. You can, every time you get an image, you can run it through this uh, Amazon recognition and it will tell you what to do, right? So you can focus on different features in your uh, app, right? So if Amazon health lake, right? So this is uh, health data, which is uh, in US, you have to be HIPAA compliant, which means it is uh, health information protection, so any uh, health data has to be, there are certain data protection that has to be applied on it, right? Uh, Amazon Redshift is uh, Amazon's uh, big data service. So they have multiple, multiple answers, okay? You can even do Amazon Game Lift. Azure has Azure Game Labs. So which means they let you run some, you know, you want to run some uh, multiplayer games, right? Your, like your PUBGs, your Fortnites, they will help you run the backend for that, right? You don't have to maintain the servers. This is all the networking. VPC is nothing but a pri uh, private, uh, this thing. You can maintain your own uh, box and say nobody can access this. Uh, all the data inside this, it can only be accessed once you connect to the VPC. So this is how most of these uh, work, right? So this is uh, an AWS console, right? And some of these are not even exposed. So uh, some of the higher cost services will be exposed only for an enterprise account. I'm a personal account, right? I'm, I use my developer account. 
so some of those only if you are a virtual uh, enterprise customer they'll even show you because they like you as a private uh, single developer you are not going to use all these services they are not for you right oh uh, yeah this is another good one device form so let's say uh, and we used this actually for testing right some of my applications had to be on a uh, on a uh, this thing uh, had to be tested on devices so if you see i had this right so there you go i can ask these guys to give me a google pixel um an apple ipad pro and uh, i want to test my application so i can uh, deploy my application there and i can test it so i don't have to buy a google P a pixel 3 and i apple ipad pro i just ask amazon to spin it up and i can deploy my code there and i can test it out right you just imagine how how useful that is right you don't have to buy these many devices to test it let me see if i can spin one up there you go yeah it needs the application i don't have any applications right now and then you can select the devices i need a ipa file or an apk file and then i can configure the device and then it will push that uh, apk file into the device and uh, you can start testing your application right so imagine especially for android when you have to test multiple different applications you don't have to buy all those phones right you can just push your application here and see how it looks and all that right so all these are like some of the biggest advantages anything anything else you guys are curious you want to see and uh, there was one question uh, yeah. sure. uh, how to meet uh, data requirements uh, for these in future um what do you mean by data requirements like for what maybe right? maybe yeah, uh, yeah future, there may be a, a large amount of data may be coming when you go for large servers yep so that is where we use the server most of the people right now use serverless where oh yeah I, okay let me show you the da data right give me one second where is the data i can show you that okay data so nowadays, storage there right? steady, nowadays, nowadays there is a steady growth in the data traffic correct so we have this s3 sir which is uh, uh, which is a bucket s3 is nothing but a hard disk right so you can create a bucket and in this you can uh, this thing it is charged by the amount of data you store right so you store one terabyte there is a cost you want to keep adding in it the cost goes up every month based on that right so in all of these it is all based on how much you use so they don't say you can only use this much there long as long as you can pay you use how much ever you want right so there is no limit to the data you want to use right now uh, my client uh, they use uh, a snowflake account on aws for 1 petabyte right because of all the network analytics that they're doing so pretty much all your calls everything right call data records network data records and all that right so cdrs so th those analytics are like lot of data they have a 1 petabyte and they were previously at i think around uh, 500 terabytes they said i want 1 petabyte so now flakers like okay here's the bill how much ever data you want we'll give you right yeah. it's as simple as that and the next one is what kind of processors does this computer use ah very good question so not always most of these use some custom chips right they don't they don't uh, use your standard uh, intel chips but you can always request for a uh, you know a custom intel chip and they'll run it right so let me take a linux instance this is uh, this thing so if you can see one second i'll show you uh, when i said launch instance you can even run an arm bit or an x86 chip so you can either run an intel amd chip or a arm chip right so let's say i choose x86 so these are all their type uh, their standard chips so they don't even tell you if it's intel amd or anything right because you are actually sharing that uh, that uh, cpu with multiple other people so they are giving you only one clock in it uh, one 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 core in it with one gb of uh, memory right network performance is low to moderate so they don't actually tell you if it is an intel or anything but if you have a specific quest right so then you can actually request them for it and they will get that set up so that is why i said enterprise always get to uh, do this 
i am sure there might be some description if you go into the uh, you know the documentation they'll mention where uh, what are the components of this but uh, like i mentioned google tensor processing unit right the tpu um, that they use for the arml that is custom built by google right so that is why the arml is so popular is it's a custom built server that they uh, you know that they use okay so yeah they don't actually mention it let me quickly check i mean you guys are interested i can quickly check azure also if they mention i don't think any of these guys mention it uh what they are using because they are, you are actually not using the entire cpu right so you are actually going to only use part of it if you ask they are going to give you one one core one gb right so let's see a virtual machine here uh create virtual machine let me see if they have induced this yeah ah okay i have lost my access to this but if you see it's in ubuntu server yeah there you go they don't mention it right so they don't even mention what size is uh, yeah so they just give general purpose they don't even mention what what uh, what it is because you are not actually using the entire uh, cpu they don't mention exactly what servers it is so a lot of it is custom made custom built um will there be any downtime in cloud server if so will there be any additional okay so this this is an interesting question right so aws did go down a couple of uh, i think a year back it went down for 6 hours a couple of years back in 2019 their west coast uh, data center went down and uh, pretty much half the internet was down right so this is where there is uh, the business continuity planning right so this is where yes they are also people they are also run by people mistakes are made so the entire internet half the internet was brought down because some guy who was deploying uh, made a typo in the configuration file and it crashed the server uh, entire data center right mistakes can be made so what pe- big companies do not all people can do it is they build redundancy so they will say i want two servers so let me give that example right so this i am in global right give me one second so these are the different data centers in the us there are four data centers in the us us east one us east two us west one us west two right so i will build let's say i am in seattle oregon is closest to me i will build my entire application uh, my entire system in oregon but i will also do a entire like to like backup in east and then in amazon you can build something called a load balancer right so which uh, what happens is if it sees that oregon is down you can write code which says hey if oregon is not fast enough immediately go to uh, east but you will be paying for twice the amount right the other thing is you can also have the option of if you do serverless you don't even have to you just have all the code every data replicated to into east and uh, you can even tell uh, aws if oregon is going down then spin up everything in east so usually they can do it in like 5 to 7 minutes so let's say your entire oregon uh, data center goes down and not just for you but for entire other customers as well if you have the uh, you know if you are ready to pay for it you can always spin it up into another center right and again that is completely up to you if you want to pay for it the uh, question is there yeah uh, okay uh, john not in virtual machines ah even for their processing of data no it's all custom yeah they're not uh, intel it's not the commercial ones so intel's biggest thing that is making revenue right now right uh, their intel is about to crash and burn in the commercial space the only reason they are popular they are making money right now is by providing these custom chips to uh, your uh cloud providers right but even that is changing now with a lot of them going to arm give me one second i'll just close the blinds you think the sun is hitting my face yeah okay so uh all of them uh, they built custom server side chips right that allow you to you know use the split the capacity by core by ram v ram and all that so yep yeah, it is not commercial chips it is not something you can walk into a electronic store or go to richie street and buy 
okay so john i hope that answers your question right so yeah it's all pretty much custom made and just on an interesting note on um, <laughs> on intel is in case you guys are unaware intel used to be one of the biggest you know chip manufacturers they are now struggling uh, to stay relevant because in the 64 bit chips the normal commercial chips amd's ryzen processors have beaten them like by leaps and bounds amd processors are cheaper than an intel processors and are performing much better and uh, apple was one of intel's biggest customers has moved into arm chips so you guys i'm sure know about arm right it's what runs your mobile so apple's m1 chips which is that what they're using in their latest laptops and desktops are not even based on x86 uh, architecture and they are pretty much killing it in performance like there's not not it's not even close right so intel is going through they have to fire their ceo they have a new ceo they're going through a period of <laughs> what am what uh, how do we reinvent ourselves but if they don't change themselves they may not be around in the next 10 years Okay, uh, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, one last question, as a yeah. faculty, I would like to ask. So, what are the skills uh, set? What is the skill set required uh, for the students uh, to work in these uh, cloud computing technologies? I think the biggest skill set we need, I think, is just the curiosity to learn it, sir. Because a lot of these, there are multiple. you know courses available on udemy youtube and everything right you just have to have the application for it this is not rocket science the what i would say and in general is just to have that curiosity to you know spend some time and learn it because most of this is nothing but oh you know how a computer works just this is computer happening at a large scale right so there is not a huge skill set gap or skills needed for this just the curiosity to take some time to and put the effort to figure out how these work they, they i learned most some, of this on my own uh, they yeah. can do some courses uh, apart from these uh, regular curriculum in uh, udemy or coursera like that huh? yep exactly yeah i i learned my aws certification completely from udemy i oh. learned it from a guy in france and uh, i got my certification okay right some of them are really really good I know it's tough to in Udemy. It's tough to <laughs> find them, but uh, some of those courses are good. And I can even paste a Telegram link. There's a ch- Telegram channel, which okay. where they keep giving these free Udemy courses throughout the day. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, yeah. So you just have to uh, you know subscribe to it, and uh, you know they keep sending AWS cloud computing, like even languages, Python, everything. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just pasted the link. Uh, students, you can copy this link. and uh, i'm also pasting my linkedin in case any of you want to connect with me ah, yeah. i yeah. Uh, good good yeah you can you can do yeah, that and i can share my email id as well please feel free to reach out and to be honest i love working with uh, you know young minds because my team is filled with a lot of uh, people who come out of colleges i love <laughs> working with them because you know you guys have a very different perspective to how we think about things most of my problem solving comes from a standard way of thinking but when i uh, you know when the new generation comes they come completely come and say why are you even doing it that way there's a different way to come with it i, I love listening to new ideas so i pasted my email id as well so you can you know reach out to me i will i would love to you know have any additional discussions the students you can copy that uh, ids uh, 